Okay, thank you very much for taking the time to come and listen to me this morning. Um, so, evolutionary medicine, um, application of modern evolutionary theory. So, I'm going to touch on that today. I'm going to touch on modern evolutionary theory, and I'm going to present things from my perspective. Um, okay. So, if we have disease, we can break that down to acute and chronic diseases. And if I was to walk out onto a London high street and get run over by a 37 red double-decker bus, I would want acute medicine on my side. I think it's important that we don't forget the great advances that's been done in modern medicine. That as much as we may have critique on certain areas, Acute medicine is brilliant. You know, I would want to be picked up. I would want to do nothing. I want anti anesthetics, antibiotics. I want um, bacterial, the understanding of bacterium theory, the hygiene theory. You know, and modern medicine's brilliant. You know, there are injuries that 100 years ago, I would have had a 95% chance of dying from. I would now have a 95% chance of surviving. And that is testament to the application of modern technology and theory into medicine. However, if I have a chronic condition, we could argue that modern medicine, well, should at least be asking around for possible new ideas. And we could then apply that to teeth. People, at the, sort of at the turn of the 1900s, um, we, people were starting to get crooked teeth. And people wanted to have straight teeth. So where there's a need, usually there comes an answer. Now, when you'd be interested what methods there were available or what methods people were having to make teeth straight, because that was the desired outcome. And this is a tale of two charismatic individuals. Well, there were probably more, there were more charismatic individuals. These just two are a representation. They're probably the most extreme two characters. We have Edward Angle on the left from the States, and we have Rolf Frankel from East Germany on the right-hand side. And they both had very different approaches. So Edward Angle had what he referred to as the E-arch, and the E-arch has now turned into fixed braces, or braces, I mean, it's generic now. They're just braces, that's what people mean. Whereas Frankel had these shields, so we know the teeth sit in the balance between the lip and the tongue, or the tongue and the cheek. We know the tooth, the bone, and the gum sit in this balance. And Frankel would try and disturb this balance with these shields. So he's trying to get closer to the cause of the problem. However, what method do you think won? Well, we know what method won. Fixed braces. That, that's what is meant by braces. If you say, I'm wearing braces, no one stops and thinks, are you wearing a Frankel appliance? I tried to find someone practicing Frankel appliances in East Germany, and I really struggled. That's just the, the, the win. Well, who wants to work with difficult, uncooperative child, children with an appliance that's potentially, well, it is, often is uncomfortable? That's how it changes people, by being uncomfortable. Well, people wanted what they wanted, which was straight teeth, and a mechanical method to make the teeth straight has one. Whereas the one that clearly is trying to affect the symptoms of the problem hasn't won, and of course we're paying the price with retention. So if you have your teeth straightened, you need to have them straightened forever. And when you look at most forms of retainers, they are in effect an orthodontic appliance, so it is effectively orthodontics forever because you're not trying to cause, sorry, you're not trying to treat the cause of the problem. Now, <clears throat> orthodontics started in the turn of the 1900s to make teeth straight, and it's been hoped that they would fill the science in later. So we've had this approach to backfilling the science to fit the treatment, which is also always dangerous. There is no understanding of the etiology, the cause of the problem. And of course, there's no real understanding of the epidemiology or the pathology. Treatment, there's possibly too many treatments, and there's no real cure, because as I said, 
permanent retention. That's not a cure, that's orthodontics forever. And I feel, is my opinion, that the orthodontic community, I mean, I'm not trying to knock the treatment too much, I'm knocking the philosophy. And I'm saying the philosophy is a philosophical house of cards that's been built up <clears throat> to look impressive, to uh, sound scientific, to fulfill their objective of being scientifically based. But it sounds, look, sounds good, it looks good, till you ask difficult questions. And normal responses don't let anyone ask any difficult questions. Now, <clears throat> it's very important to understand what normal is. Because if you don't know what normal is, you will struggle to understand a disease. And that is normal. If your teeth don't bite together like that, now this is a slightly warm dentition, a slightly extreme level of wearing. But this is far closer to normal than any of you here. Um, and notice the, the, the huge space behind the wisdom teeth. You know, one if not two centimeters of spare space behind the wisdom teeth. Then you've got the gap at the front. And, well, I won't go into canine guidance, but if you wanted to cut something that you were eating, you did this. You incised it with your incisors. That's what they're for. You're never going to have a jaw that's too far forward or too far back if every time you eat anything, you have to incise it with your incisors. And you're having to do that for a significant portion of every day, as they did, which is why they wore their teeth out. Now, I'm trying to make you understand the changes in facial form that occur. So this face is going to drop down to the classic adenoidal face type. It's been with us for years, the adenoidal face type. And most of you will be halfway through that pattern. So if you watch this, as a face drops down, it drops down from a more ancestral perspective through to where most of you are and going beyond to being um, quite downswung. But we know people are different. We know we have the class ones, the class twos, the class threes, the different types of crookedness. And of course, these are layered on top. Because if your face, as you've got weak, soft food from the modern diet, we're hanging our mouths open because we've changed our posture from incidence of nasal obstruction. Our tongues come off the roof of the mouth our lip seal has been broken, so we're now like this. Faces are dropping down. As the face becomes longer, it becomes narrower and shallower, reducing cross-sectional area. And as that happens, you eventually have to respond. I mean, I think the face can drop about 10 millimeters, and, you know, you're perfectly healthy. You know, humanity, humans are well-built. We're well-designed. But beyond that then you have to change. The first thing you're going to do is hold your head forward, forward head posture, because that opens up your airway. The second thing you do is you have to find a new place to place your tongue so that you can eat, you can talk, you can um, do everything else you need to do with your mouth. And there are only so many comfortable places that you can place your tongue. No, I don't. Do I trust these? I haven't done slides many times before. Oh, sorry, I haven't done movies. Ah, uh, yeah, here we go. So these are going through. So this is the class one, where you just put your tongue between your teeth, generally. Class two, the pattern is like this. And class three, you put your tongue in the mandible and hold it forwards. So those different patterns give the different types of face. And that's just the most generic base patterns. There's a lot of subtleties with the swallowing and the function as well. But in generic, that's why from one type of facial form, we get these, you know, big spread of patterns. And that's patterns from patterns of behavior. But you can see we've had this major change in structure. And this is just from pre-industrial. This isn't going all the way back. And you can see, particularly in the transverse, look how narrow people are and how many people get nasal obstructions now. But are you surprised you're getting nasal obstructions? This is a sea change in structure. And you can see how it's got longer and it's dropped back. So as I said, it's down swinging. 
And of course, a face that's not the right shape doesn't work properly. And here is a distribution of different symptoms. So notice we've got the have highlighted sleep apnea, jaw joint, and scoliosis. It's just some sort of the range of problems we have. Clearly, I'm an orthodontist, so I come from malocclusion direction. But I couldn't say there's hard primary evidence on all of this. That's not where you start with a new science. You start trying to prove or disprove something. And I would like to discuss this with any orthodontic professor on the planet. Anyone. You know, that's my problem. No one has ever engaged with me, ever, in any form of meaningful engagement. The only real response I can have to my arguments is people running away. And that is usually the limit of the response I get. Now, so we're breaking this down. We're talking about sleep apnea. I mean, what I don't have here is, a, is the distortion on the facial form. Because people aren't thinking about that when they're making these slides. Because they're thinking faces grow normally. But clearly what we've got here is a face that's already halfway down that downswing as described by craniofacial dystrophy. But clearly the tongue's on the back of the throat because you lack space. The whole face is being truncated with the tongue falling in the airway. Now, there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a concept going forward from Stephen Sheldon in Chicago, Kevin knows him well, saying that there is no such thing as ADHD. There's these kids who can't sleep properly. You know, if you've had kids, and if you've got a group of them and they've not slept well, well, what's the difference between them and kids with ADHD? They're the same. And what are we giving to kids with ADHD? We're giving them amphetamines to wake them up, because clearly they are tired. <clears throat> and of course, my father was dealing with people with sleep apnea in the 80s. So it's great that it's got a lot of attention now that it needs, but we have been thinking a while, having already understood sleep apnea. So we talk about eustachian tube. The idea here is your tongue is supposed to be on the palate. Most of you, you won't fully fit your tongue on the palate, not to properly operate. But if the tongue can't go on the palate, and the, the muscles at the back of your throat aren't very well um, set up because your facial form has changed, then you don't open the eustachian tube when you swallow. Then this, this is an interesting case I found because clearly they've taken out a premolar tooth in this area here and they've taken out the wisdom tooth here. So that's eight teeth down in the mouth. They've done the top and the bottom. And he's still crowding up, or she. So what's going on? What are you going to do now? Take out more teeth to straighten things up? I'm surprised people actually speak as well as they do, but I've helped a lot of young kids speak better by providing more space. And, of course, we could go on to jaw joint pain. I won't dwell on the subject today. And, of course, appearance. So this is your classic adenoidal face, and this has been with us for centuries I could argue that this is the village idiot. Because the adenoidal face is the person whose tongue's falling in their airway, they're going to get sleep apnea, they're affected. And that is the classical image of the village idiot. Now, on the right-hand side, I've got the top cases someone I've treated, and you see how we've got the whole face to grow up and forwards. I've not just moved the bottom jaw forward, I've moved the top jaw forwards as well. That's not easy. It's also not cost-effective. The bottom, bottom case is, I think, Stanley Liu from um, Stanford, and a, a fantastic result. If doing the same thing as I would like with surgery to correct sleep apnea. But of course, having a major impact on facial form. And remember, I'm talking about tribal uniformity. We'll come back to that later. Of course, then we talk about body posture. Well, we're aware that we've gone from looking at the horizon for predators and prey to looking at televisions, desktops, laptops, and now tablets. That's not helping. But I'd also say one of the underlying reasons of a forward head posture is you have to hold your head forward to breathe, to open your airway. 
And if you try, many of you, if you try to do a Mackenzie chin tuck and stand up straight with perfect head posture, you're crushing your airway. You can't breathe properly. So as much as the angel on one side is saying, you know, you know the theory, you want to stand up straight, yada, yada, yada. You've got the devil on the other side that says, breathe. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't know if I can keep my attention on much during the day, but you're going to end up flipping back to a forward head posture. And this is for all the movement people we had here today, or this weekend. I'd really love your intake. On, you know, several of you, you've got forward head postures. Hello, wake up. You know, what are you doing about that? Um, now, um, obstructive sleep apnea, we know it's increasing. So I qualified from dentistry in 93. When I qualified in 93, sleep apnea wasn't in the syllabus. I talked to an um, ENT surgeon, otolaryngology, I think you call it, um, uh, recently, and he said he felt, in his opinion, that 20% of the people in westernized societies were going to die a decade early. That's 20%. Now, we know it's going up, and of course people are saying it's going up with obesity, and of course age, yeah, well, everything goes up when you get older, unfortunately. But I would argue that there's a lot of good research that suggests maybe it's not just obesity that makes you have sleep apnea, that if you get sleep apnea, you may get obese. You certainly crave all of the foods that would likely make you obese after that bad night's sleep. You know, that's well researched, it's well understood. And also I was talking to a, a surgeon from Australia, Paul Kosyarnik, I think, great surgeon, a great book, I'd recommend, Six Ways to Design a Face. And he was pointing out the number of times he does that surgery like Stanley Lou I showed you, he moves the maxilla forwards, he moves the palate forwards, and these guys come back afterwards and says, uh, they, he says, how are you going? He goes, I can run. What do you mean? He says, I'm a sportsman all of a sudden. He says, I always thought I was a poor sportsman. But now, hey, I'm kicking it, and I love it. So by moving the palate forwards, by opening up the airway, suddenly these people could run, they could exercise. That interested me, clearly. <clears throat> so, what I'm saying is a destructive technology. And destructive technology causes change. People don't like change. Here's just a list of the people who I will upset. <laughs> and you know I'm going to upset them. And of course, they're going to turn around to me and say, what evidence have you got? Well, I don't have a huge amount of primary evidence. Our new ideas don't start with lots of primary evidence. They start with a concept. You know, I was watched a program the other day on when was evolution actually proved, because when Darwin put it forward, there wasn't a lot of proof for it. It was amazing how within the next 10 years the proof arrived. But you don't start with the proof, you start with a hypothesis, and that's how science progresses. Um, but there are certain breaks on challenge. We've got medical inertia, well, it's famous medical inertia, isn't it? You know, we were bloodletting for possibly too far, too long. Um, clearly, when there's money involved, uh, medicine and money, you know. You know. Um, <laughs> status, we've got, you know, people have got qualifications, you've got a vested interest. You know, imagine you did two, three years hard graft to get this qualification. Or if you're a professor, you're a professor of what? After I turn up and mess it all up for you. You know, it's not what people want to hear. And of course, there are repercussions. Repercussions on what's gone on in the past. And Well, these are two cases that were treated <clears throat> with orthodontics. My father went on national television in 1998, saying he felt orthodontics could damage faces. He was... His reputation wasn't the same afterwards, <laughs> should we say. I'd say he probably has the lowest reputation of anyone in medicine, point blank, in the UK. You know, don't go again, don't make suggestions. But if we can change facial growth, then you can either change it positively or negatively. That goes to reason. And sometimes you may do it negatively. And I'm not saying this happens a lot, but this has never been fully discussed with all parties involved. 
You know, the AAO meeting, the white paper, didn't invite all the parties. In Britain, no one ever talked to my father about what he meant as they made research to try and prove he was wrong. But you could potentially make the statement, sometimes does an elective procedure, like orthodontics, compound or even cause sleep apnea, therefore reducing intelligence, life expectancy, and your facial form. Because if an elective procedure ever does that, it needs investigating in a free, fair, and full manner. And I know it's controversial just saying that. You know people will be upset that I even brought that subject up. Now, your face is your ID. It's that image that looks back at you from any mirror in the world. And what I'm saying is that if your face didn't grow well, you may be looking ugly. That is your fault, and that may well have significant health implications. Whoa, this is a difficult mess. This is what has held this science back, you know? And of course, there's this prevailing trend, isn't there? What do you think the woke movement will do to me? You know, I'm saying don't be happy with where you are. Get off your ass and change. And I notice when I'm trying to motivate people, coming up with ways of motivating people, or when I'm trying to do marketing, that's when you realize how far I cross that line. But I cross the Rubicon of disagreeing with this. Um, <laughs> now, so who makes money? A dietitian or a liposurgeon? Because one drives a Ferrari, the other drives a bicycle. <laughs> and of course, it all comes down to that famous thing, money. Prevention doesn't make money, and that could easily be supplied to the whole of this movement. It's where this movement comes down, you know? There's a pill for every ill, and hey, don't pills make money? Whereas exercises don't. Now, we have changed that because people now pay to go down the gym. They pay for their medicine. They sweat and they pay for it in physical terms as well as wallet terms. You know, and we've got this movement. People are trying to eat healthily. So it is possible to change society, to change people. But it's not easy. You need some stimulus to make them do it. But of course, <clears throat> and of course facial appearance and orthodontics are big. You know, 50 to 70% of people in the UK, in America, are having orthodontics. And it seems to be that if more people could afford it, more people would be having it done. And of course, as I said, the only people interested in the message I'm saying are people with faces. But if you do have a face, you seem to be very, very interested in what I'm saying. But of course, this 50 to 70%, that's been going up remarkably. We've got all this adult orthodontics. You know, I don't go into a dental surgery where people aren't advertising Invisalign or Social Smith 6 or these other methods. It's as if everyone's jumping on the bandwagon. And, okay. Now, so the only people interested, I gave this lecture, now infamous in the UK, and this started this craze of mewing that's going. So I wasn't expecting this. It was, you know, it was God-given, really. Um, I had been working to get something to go viral, so I had had that objective. Um, anyway, I, uh, look, someone sent me these statistics recently. And what you'll notice in the statistics, the one on the top left hand there, so just on TikTok, I don't do TikTok, by the way, I haven't got any videos on TikTok, but of the hashtag, hashtag mewing, it's been seen 1.1 billion times. That is insane. And of course, I could say the same thing for my MAME, that's up at 25 million. Um, but otherwise, and of course, it's, it's all around the world. <clears throat> I'm surprised on the countries that seem to be coming up at top at times. But there is this, yeah, craze going on. But mewing works. Now, you see this boy, he's healthier. His tongue is held further away from his airway. You see, she, her tongue's further from her airway. Just looking at that one aspect, how close your tongue is to your airway. The distance from your chin, 
back to the throat. And you can see she's healthier. <clears throat> and this girl as well. This boy. And that boy. And, but also, they're better looking, aren't they? So this thing, the health and this looks, you know, this is this, it's just, you know. Now, read that joke. Now, I've selected that, I've chosen that slide well, because it's, it's very easy, we come and we talk about all these medical things and how important medicine is. And people are saying, oh, well, Mike, you're just making pretty faces. You know, you shouldn't be here in this medical area. You should be out there in that aesthetics. You know, you'd be down there with those plastic surgeons because you're just making pretty faces. And this is what's held this subject back because this is relationship between how well you've grown and how healthy you are. If I say that in any respect to any other part of the body, it's obvious. But if I said that to the face, people can have a sense of humor loss. And, <clears throat> you know, these things are related. You know, are we attracted? Are we inherently, are we genetically engineered to be attracted to healthier people or less healthy people? What do we think? In Darwin's philosophy of mate selection, remember his dad, granddad came up with evolution, he came up with mate selection. So, it's just a pretty face, isn't it? Well, when you go back in time, everyone had pretty faces. So there's the himba, and you know, this is basically what Weston Price was saying. But you'll notice their teeth aren't worn down like that original face I showed you. So they are way different. There's no, just because they're dressed up to look tribal, don't be drawn in that they're living a natural lifestyle. They've got knives. They've changed their, you know, I would say 50% from them, from their natural lifestyle of hunter-gatherer to us, just having a knife. Made a major change in how you're going to eat your food. So they don't have that wear pattern. And it seems that all through life, the kids, the aunts, everyone. And that's how we all should be. Well, again, they're halfway. I, I wonder if we would actually find someone from a true hunter-gatherer. I think they might be beyond our envelope of what we would think would be tipped off. But you see, all good facial form, all of them health and beauty. This thing goes together, doesn't it? But, of course, the empire strikes back. So, in um, November, I've got a court case where they're going to try and take my license away. <clears throat> and it's been brutal. It's been dominated the last five years of my life. And I'm going into court without an expert, because there aren't any experts that really believe in what I'm saying. And that's a tough one to pull off. It's not going to be a level playing field, because I'm trying to put forward... I don't have direct evidence. And without direct evidence, you're, you're slightly screwed, to be honest. And if you don't have an expert and you're going to challenge their expert, it's not a good position to be in. And of course, <clears throat> everyone in the courtroom are going to believe that the way their face grew, the fact that they don't have wisdom teeth, is normal. And realize if you don't have your wisdom teeth in your mouth, you are way from normal. You're an affected person. And everyone there will already believe where that is. That's normal. They're biased. Now, I know what cards to remove from that house of cards, but you can't do that in the courtroom. I've focused on the etiology, the cause. But I do think this is a travesty of science. This is not how science is supposed to be. I challenged my profession to a debate on the cause over and over again, and I never got that. <clears throat> and this has been censorship because my insurance company has stopped me saying anything. And that's what normally happens. And you just slip below the horizon. And however, I've moved from being suppressed to being persecuted. And in being persecuted, well, that's newsworthy. As you'll see, this is newsworthy. We've got a camera crew here today. And they're making a documentary on us. And we are making headway. Um, but in a way, I need your help. In a way, I could help you. You know... Modern medicine, you, you know the barriers to changing modern medicine. You know, it's all well established. There's already this pushback happening. There isn't that in dentistry, particularly not in the UK. Now, when are we going to reach 
of people dying 10 years early from sleep apnea and its consequences. It'll be soon. And what we really need is a revolution. Many of you here will be affected by the problems I'm saying. You know, forward head posture, snoring, sleep apnea. Um, you had orthodontics, struggle with breathing through your noses. Um, you know, what I want is debate, scientific engagement. I just want the scientific process. I've been asking for no more again and again. I've done the letter writing campaign. I've put enough stuff out there saying all I want is debate. And again, any professor on the planet, any time, I'm ready for meaningful engagement. Okay, thank you very much. Mike, Mike, I'm going to talk to. Yeah, Mike. you can. I can hear you. Um, anyway, um, I'll shout then. Um, Wait, when, when you're close, it works. Oh, I'm not close. Okay, sorry. Um, yesterday we ran out of time. You know, James skillfully kept us on time. But the last slide I was going to show: How do we fix it? There's a number of peer-reviewed orthodontic journals that call malocclusion or what you have identified as craniofacial dystrophy uh, as being a developmental variant or situation, but not a disease. Malocclusion is not a disease by your orthodontic peers. Could you please um, speak to that? Because it's causing a lot of problems. Well, okay, so if, at the moment we're in a situation where we're all affected. So we're all, as I said, I showed you the face dropping down and back. We're all at the halfway, we're, we're, well, some more than others, you know, we're a range around that halfway point. And when you're in that halfway point where everyone's affected, you can't see the wood for the trees. When you're in that place where you think having wisdom teeth or a, a, wisdom teeth or a genetic abnormality we don't need anymore, at that point, you can't see the wood for the trees. You, you don't know what's happening because... Everyone's affected. And we're in a situation where, because everyone's affected, you imagine that crooked teeth is a variation around the norm. And that's what we're seeing at the moment. You know, that's the comment from the orthodontics that malocclusion is a variation around the norm. But if you had Himba people living in your village, on your town, you wouldn't think it was a variation around the norm because you would see people who were had developed so much better. Malocclusion is a symptom of another disease. So malocclusion is a symptom of craniofacial dystrophy. It's a symptom of not having enough space for the teeth. But you see this as a barrier to the public seeking medical treatment. There are so many barriers. It's one of many barriers. The biggest barrier is people wanting to believe that the way their face has grown is genetic. That's you, that's your personality, that's your identity. You did a pretty, you did a really convincing, uh, you have a convincing argument that, that there's this major problem and you know, I'm, I'm biased because I already, I'm on board with that and understand that the general scientific community doesn't agree, but um, you also hinted at a possible solution with the mewing, you, it, like that that can help. Is that what you would prescribe uh, because it, you didn't really go into what, what the actual yeah, I, solution would so be. So I haven't got, yeah, clearly there's a limit to what I can put out in a lecture. What I'm saying, what, I should highlight this slide on the top left. The slide on the left is prevent crooked teeth campaign. So please take some time. Could everyone go Google prevent crooked teeth? Sign up to that campaign because the answer has to be prevention. You know... <clears throat> Prevention, what I'm saying basically could be boiled down to stand up straight and shut your mouth. That's not a new idea. The, the pathology could be summed up as shut your mouth or the wind will change and your face will set like that. That's not a new idea. If you want to prevent kids, take kids. I, I, I don't want to be drawn under about four years old. From about four years old, you could be chewing gum, lip taping, and just telling kids, sit up straight, shut your mouth. You know, eat with your mouth shut. 
This has a huge and powerful benefit to helping teeth straighten, line up. As I said, teeth sit in its balance between the lips and the tongue. Get the lips working correctly. But what I do work-wise, I showed you this case here. You know, it's a lovely result. I've changed that kid's life. The life he's going to go on and have is going to be just completely different. He'd have got worse if I hadn't intervened. Yet, it is not very profitable. I'm just getting it to the point of being profitable now, but to teach other people how to do this, it's really hard work. You need to be really dedicated and focused to get those cipher changes. It, it is, we need to work on it. We need to work on that science, but that's what, how science develops by working on them. The other thing I'm curious about, you listed some problems that go along with the tooth problem. The hearing is one example. I'm wondering if there's a connection with the uh, epidemic of myopia because of the yeah, fact I think that the it face is narrowing. It. Myopia parallels this perfectly. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that at this level of change you're getting at someone, you're probably actually influencing that part of the skull. That interests me. But either way, it, it parallels my opinion, you know, a modern disease of modern society because we're changing our environment. Thank you. So I was one of the many kids who had orthodontics from first grade to you know, college. Ultimately, I had the Frankel. I had braces multiple times. I had permanent teeth pulled. And now I'm working with a dentist that seems very much aligned with your philosophy to correct all of that um, that was done as a kid. And um, my question for you, one of the things that, you know, through this process of correcting a lot of this, realigning my jaw, I'll be doing the upper palate expansion. Um, one of the things she mentioned too as a possibility is tongue tie release. And I hear that a lot in kind of the more holistic dentistry world. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. <clears throat> I mean, there's the old argument, do tongue ties not become released. So uh, you get a residual tongue tie because you haven't been using that muscle properly? Or is it because the muscle's tied? I mean, it's a chicken and egg, really. And I, I think I'm, I'm cautious when it comes to tongue ties. I slightly sit on the fence. My father remembers a time when he was younger where they, everyone was rash cutting tongue ties. So does my grand... So I didn't ever met my grandfather, but so apparently did my grandfather. So this, this is the third point when tongue ties have been in vogue. I'm a little bit more cautious. I see too much post-operative scarring because people don't then stretch their tongue and use it properly. So I think in extreme cases, yes. I think we risk over-treating because it's flavor of the month. And it makes certain you really exercise before and afterwards. Because if you really do that, then it's great. It works. If you don't, waste of time. Okay, but, uh, but what I would like of the Ancestral Health Symposium, what I want to do is I want to take evidence that doesn't yet exist. I would like anyone who can to write me an article from their perspective on craniofacial dystrophy. Because if I could take through 10, 20 articles like that, written from other people, from other professions, that can validate what I'm saying, craniofacial dystrophy. Then I put, start putting together some type of science, something to help me, and help me help you, because this is an ancestral subject. If we can get this one across the line, it helps the whole movement. Thank you very much.